so thank you for the invitation. Thanks for coming here. I've got the easy talk today, actually, because uh, um, I think, as Jim said, well, I mean, I, I sometimes say about working on energy that you start as a scientist by thinking that it's science and then that it's technology and then that maybe it's economics and then maybe it's politics and finally you discover it's all about people and it's social science. Uh, so I'm going to try hard to stick to the first one, but I'll kind of wander over the edge on, on, on occasion. So, uh, ah, good. Oh, interesting. So, um, you know, the, the, this of course is the standard question really about sustainability. The, the, um, I'll only try and answer the can question. Um, but this is the big one that we've all been referred to. And by the way, what does physics have to do with that? Um, and so, um, the, because I'm a theoretical physicist, I'm very literal and I'm really rather dumb. Theoretical physicists can only do very simple calculations. And the whole of this talk is going to be a sequence of, uh, of, of broad arguments which don't have details in it. But I noticed kind of interesting um, polls. And what does the public think? about this. Um, the recent Globescan poll, um, I'm never sure how accurate these polls are, but this is asking people around the world. And 71% of the people polled for this thought their country could replace coal and nuclear energy within 20 years by becoming highly energy efficient and focusing on generating energy from the sun and the wind. Uh, it, you know, it's interesting that they share that level of optimism. Maybe I should do a poll around here, actually, at the beginning of this room, <laughs> see how optimistic they are, because people here are very knowledgeable about this thing, and I doubt if we'd hit 71%. Um, I, now, this, this, you know, you've probably seen those, those HSBC adverts as you get off the plane, these kind of annoying things. Uh, well, no, this is one of them, okay? So, the, so I saw this in Edinburgh Airport, actually. Well, 0.3% of solar energy on the Sahara could power Europe. And I suppose the question about that one, is that true? Is that false? Or is that, of course, a fantasy being somewhere in between? And you'll guess that um, some sense it really has to be the latter one. Are you going to answer these questions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy one to answer. <laughs> so, but I mean, but the other thing is that, you know, because I'm a physicist, you know, I mean, actually, theoretical physicists are extraordinarily annoying. I mean, I, I, uh, I don't get invited to dinner very often. And the reason is that when I do get invited to dinner, as a theoretical physicist, I regard myself as an instant expert on every single topic. <laughs> uh, you've all had people like me to dinner. But I'm going to tell you how to operate as an armchair expert or do theoretical physics without really trying. And that's sort of the purpose of this talk. I should say what it's not, a, what the lecture is actually about. I want to spend a little bit of time on climate change, but I want to talk about climate change in the context of thermodynamics, because it's uh, large-scale physics of the environment, just, just broadly, because we often make climate change seem very complicated, very uncertain, very model-dependent, and my point is that there are some, some rules which are absolutely inalienable, inalienable and since uh, 1896, when the first quantitative paper was published on this topic, the answers have not changed. Um, I do want to talk about you know, how much energy is out there and how much we use. And again, this is of large-scale analysis. How hard is the problem? Um, and then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about energy technologies, because that is our business at Argonne, of course it's your business too, business of many people, and the question is there is how much space do we have? Um, and there's lots of things that I just won't talk about. I'm not going to talk about nuclear, I won't talk about resource use or about water, I won't talk about policy because there are really some experts here, and I won't talk about climate change, well actually maybe I will. Um, so the question is, and this is a methodological question, well do you believe you can ask questions like this, do you believe, in anthropogenic climate change? Um, and whether you do or not, how did you come to that conclusion? Now, it's often presented this way. So this is what I see all of the time. You see data on atmospheric CO2. This is from 1960 to 2010. Uh, atmospheric CO2 measured at, uh, uh, at Hawaii. And you see it's gone up from uh, 315 to about 390 now. And you know, the very best data on the global temperature, uh, so-called temperature anomaly, 
has shifted by about half a degree Celsius over that period of time. Um, so now the question is, you know, what do you make of this? There are various possibilities. Well, that one actually caused the other. Of course, you don't know which way around. Um, it could be some fluctuation. This is pretty noisy data, and goodness knows what else is going on. Um, or it could be correlated for other reasons that have nothing to do with each other. And I think we spend a lot of our time looking at data and trying to assume that data will uh, give you the answer. Um, and I'm a theoretical physicist that I know that that isn't true. Okay? <laughs> right? So, the, 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 so um, but actually I want to go, so I, actually the theory is much better. Right? So we go back to this guy, Svante Arrhenius, who's actually very famous. And, but in 1896, published a paper which he says is on the influence of carbonic acid in the air upon the temperature of the ground. Okay. Now, the, by the way, the, the idea of um, uh, um, you know, CO2 and, and the so-called greenhouse effect goes back at least 70 years earlier, but he's the first guy to do a calculation. Um, actually, by the way, Svante Arenas is, is very interesting because uh, uh, for the work for which he got a Nobel Prize, which was more or less begun as part of his PhD thesis, he got a PhD, which was, those PhDs in those days in Sweden were graded A, B, C, and D, and D was a fail, and he just got a C. <laughs> 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 and, was, and was not able to work in the country and had to move abroad because they thought he was so dumb. Okay? Right. But, but, but let, let me give you his argument, and, and so the first argument is, you know, what is the temperature of Mars? Mars is very easy, it doesn't have an atmosphere. But so if the Earth was like Mars and didn't have an atmosphere, some things we know. We know the incident flux, this number will come back, 341.5 watts per square meter in the hot solar spectrum. Um, it hits the ground, um, and about 30% of it gets reflected back. So there's this parameter alpha, which is fungible, which has to do with how much is reflected. Um, and the, the, rest is, the rest would be absorbed, and then uh, a bit of physics here. The radiation depends on the temperature. This is uh, Stefan's law. Um, and therefore, the radiation balance is formed by Stefan's constant times the surface temperature to the fourth power. Uh, and sigma is known really, really rather well. Um, so we don't need to worry about that one. Um, the only other parameter which isn't known so well is alpha. But if you work this out, that will give you a temperature of the Earth without an atmosphere of minus 18 Celsius on average. And by the way, if you do this calculation for Mars, it gets it right on. It has to. Okay. Now, suppose uh, we were completely covered by clouds. That's Venus. Right? Okay. So in that case, you actually have a different calculation to do. You still have the same energy incident. There's some reflected from the surface and there's some absorbed. But there's a cloud layer, not to be confused with you know, administrations, it's a real cloud layer. Uh, and so the surface temperature is radiated, radiated into the atmosphere, and that atmosphere is at a different temperature, and of course that can be radiated down and up. So there's two temperatures in here, the things that you have to work out. And if you do that for the Earth, you get an average <coughs> surface temperature of plus 30 Celsius. Okay. Do this calculation for Venus, it works too. Okay. Um, so, uh, our atmosphere is partially transparent, and there's another parameter, and we are somewhere in between. Okay? Um, and so, because uh, the atmosphere is partially transparent, some of the energy goes through, let's call that 1 minus epsilon, and only this amount gets, gets radiated back. And if you do that number, you hit a number which is probably in the ballpark of where we are, namely plus 15 Celsius. Now, by the way, the purpose of this calculation is not to see if we can get the temperature right. The purpose of this calculation is to see what happens if I change the two critical parameters in here, namely alpha and epsilon. Okay. Um, uh, you know, but just a comment on this, right? That, you know, what are the approximations we've made in here? Well, you know, I've used uh, two fundamental laws of physics, but I've made a big assumption that the atmosphere is actually well mixed, that they can be described just by two parameters. Well, those parameters are actually now very well known. Um, and what happens if you double CO2? It changes uh, the absorption of the atmosphere by about 2%. That is a small change in the so-called radiative forcing, 345 watts per square meter coming in. This 2% change is like having an extra 3.7 watts 
Okay, it's about 1%. But that by itself gives you a linear prediction of uh, the temperature change of 1.2 Kelvin. Um, and, you know, and the other principle, of course, I'm using here is I'm using a linear response analysis. Okay? Now, is the linear response analysis believable? I don't know, but it's not a bad start. This is a 1% forcing change. Um, we can look at the nonlinearities, and there are lots of nonlinearities, but globally they seem to be largely positive because actually you raise the temperature, you get more water in the atmosphere. Water is a bigger greenhouse gas than CO2. You can compute that one pretty easily as a second order correction. Changes in the albedo, methane, a certain uncertainty in clouds. Most of these feedbacks are positives. But after you've done all of that, and by the way, most of these calculations can be done literally on the back of an envelope. They don't need a global climate model, and you get about 3K. Um, now, the purpose of global climate models is to do something different. The purpose of global climate models is not to try and decide whether this number is true or not. It's to try and decide what is going to happen in particular areas of the globe and to model particular changes that might, might occur. Because uh, the fact that the averages are changing uh, doesn't mean that things might not locally be very different. By the way, how have these predictions changed over a century? So this is the Arrhenius number, actually, which was 6 Kelvin. And the reason, by the way, it's 6 Celsius. And the reason that that was so big is he didn't know uh, epsilon very well. Um, if, he'd, if you put in the modern numbers, it comes down right around here, the number I told you. Um, this is what's happened with climate research over the last century. And globally, these things haven't changed. And it's a very, very simple story. Um, so you know, purpose, you know, don't get confused about why we're doing global climate modeling. It's not to decide whether, uh, whether the basic principles are operating. Okay. Um, something about numbers, which I realize that there's no clock in here. It's it also now. Fine, OK, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep an eye on this. Right, good. So um, I need to get moving. So you've got a very strange whiteboard here, actually. It's just a remarkable <laughs> place. <laughs> Obviously, the last speaker had trouble with their, with their arguments. <laughs> we'll erase it in between talks. <laughs> Good. So, um, right, so uh, energy in, energy out. 341.5 watts per square meter is the average radiative solar flux. And this gets uh, redistributed into other degrees of freedom. As a physicist, that means heat, wind energy, wave energy, and rainfall. And that's what we've got to play with. Okay? So how much do we need? Um, nice number. US average power consumption is 3 terawatts. Uh, if you take that and divide by that, how much space? Well, that's 5 billion microwave ovens um, to get a feeling for how much energy we're using. And this is simply the solar flux on 10,000 square kilometers. So we can devote Delaware, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't picking on you, but Delaware and Rhode Island would do it, right? Small so states. Small states, you know, instead of a minor loss to the, the nation. <laughs> that's right. So, yeah. So, you know, so, so of course, that's the, you know, HSBC poster, right? A uh, lot of energy, not very much space. Okay? Um, well, now, we'll come back to the space issue and where you would get that from in the U.S. in a moment. I also want to point out that, the, not surprisingly, these, the actual available solar, solar energy depends on where you are um, and why policy begins to look different in different places. So these are US states. And what we're looking at here is where that energy is actually used. And so uh, we'll start by looking at the population measured on this axis, a log scale, and the area along this axis. So Alaska is up here. Um, England is over here, uh, and you know, a much higher population density, and the range here is about three orders of magnitude, even within the US. Um, uh, and, you know, but notice, and by the way, this is the world, which is 43, which is actually pretty much close to where the US is. Most of Europe, of course, is much more dense, so these are European countries, is much more densely populated. Changes the way they think about things. Now, this one, um, by the way, these graphs are courtesy of David Mackay, who's uh, um, actually a theoretical physicist, a colleague of mine from the University of Cambridge, who is the chief science advisor to the Department of Energy and Climate Change in the UK. So, he's a, so David is a good person to talk to about this. 
Now what we're looking at here is population density from the last axis, ranging from numbers like 10 to 1,000, and on this axis, energy consumption per person. Um, so the world is in the middle, it's right here. Um, uh, the US is up here, high energy consumption per person, but relatively low population density. Um, uh, but if you come down here, India, as you notice, is over in this place, uh, low energy consumption, high population density. And there are other places in here. Singapore is off the map, it's somewhere here, uh, Bahrain, and then, you know, poor countries, uh, mostly in Africa, you, you find down here. Now, these lines running across here are then energy consumption per unit area. Right? Um, so 10 watts per square meter, 1 watt per square meter, 0.1, etc., 0.01. Let's put this on the scale here and then start looking at renewable. So this is the same thing from the previous. It's over there. And now I've put the uh, energy available in the desert sun, which is around 250 watts per square meter if you go to Arizona. That's what you've got. And that's way up here. Uh, in the UK, if it happens to be sunny, it's not often the case, but you'll get about 110. And what do technologies bring you? Well, the best technology for concentrated solar power is 20 watts per square meter, and it's already here. And you notice that that only works for Hong Kong, just about, if the whole of Hong Kong is for solar power, and Singapore already has to think of a different policy. Okay. If you look at wind power, 2.5 watts per square meter, that's a pretty standard number, um, already, uh, South Korea is here, U UK is there. Um, uh, even with things like that, that's a problem. The, I mean, the, the US is, is still over here. Um, energy crops, well, that varies a bit, but it's often not much better than about half a watt per square meter. Um, and so, you know, so the US is now getting close to the edge of that. And by the way, notice the difference between the US and countries like Brazil. A, uh, a, a country with relatively low energy use, large population density, very sunny. Uh, using biofuels in Brazil makes a hell of a lot more sense than it does in the United States, for obvious reasons. Okay. Um, so, you know, these numbers are naturally going to drive the way you think about technology. So now let's take concentrated solar power in the US. This is a map from NREL saying where it's sunny. Uh, and not surprisingly, it's very sunny over there, and it's not so sunny up here. Okay. Um, uh, and the uh, power density you know, varies enormously from, from places like this to there. Okay. So now let's look at that number I told you before. So three terawatts of power. Um, actually, just a point actually about how much power we're using. At the moment, in, in 2011, the US installed what it would claim would be two gigawatts of power. Um, this is a bad number because when, they, when, you, when somebody sells you a kilowatt solar panel, it means that if you put it in the Arizona sun in the middle of the day, you get out a kilowatt. Um, actually, you, no, you, you, you in fact get about 20 to 30 percent at best. Um, so this, by the way, is just 0.02 percent of demand. And how far can one go to scale it up? So let's look at the area. Um, and think about making technologies and technologies by volume. Our current solar photovoltaic technology, while it's not made in a fab like that, it's not so different. Um, but, you know, silicon technology, what is it? We know about it. Well, silicon wafers for, for IT um, shipped what seems like a vast amount of stuff, 2,033 million square inches. That sounds like a really big number, okay? Um, uh, well, um, that's actually 1.2 square kilometers, and it is not surprisingly uh, just about the same area as the, of you know, a major fab. So this is Global Foundries Fab in, in Malta, New York. That's 1.2 square kilometers. This is from, from Google. Okay. Um, how much area would I need in the U.S. to get all of its energy resources from, uh, uh, from the sun? If you had... 100% efficient technology, it ain't so bad. This is Phoenix Airport. I, I'm sorry, I seem to have picked on, on, on various bits. It's a big airport, actually, but, that, but that's it. So, if you, so that isn't so bad. 
So sorry, this is the 2011 solar uh, capacity. So this is how much has been installed in the US, about 10 square kilometers. That's actually quite a lot. If we had 100% efficient technology and we installed it in Arizona, we would have to give up Phoenix, um, you know, another minor loss. You know, if, yeah, that's right, that's right. So, the, so uh, but that's 10,000 square kilometers. That's so, you know, so ra the, uh, of course, if you take uh, concentrated solar, that's 150,000 square kilometers. And now you're beginning to see the Mexican border down here. So here's still Phoenix. Uh, you know, you lose a bit of the Grand Canyon. If you do it with photovoltaics, it's this much. Um, and if you make the mistake of installing them up here, where you'll get typically about half a watt per square meter, you're using the whole of the East Coast of the United States. Um, scale is everything, actually, in these technologies. Um, so let's look at some others. We talked about wind, hydro, wave. Um, wind. Um, uh, so what is that? Well, actually, the biggest one you can buy at the moment is a 7.5-megawatt uh, uh, wind farm, which weighs about 6,000 tons. Remember that number. I'll come back to it in a moment. The density you can place these things, which is actually a consequence of fluid dynamics, there's physics in here, is, uh, is you put them six to ten times the rotor diameter apart. That's the densest you can put them. Uh, the area per rotor is this number. I can now work out then the power per unit area, uh, which is about 18 watts per square meter. But in practice, I'll get 35% even in a windy place. So that's how I get the number six watts per square meter. By the way, notice that this is basically the same as we're getting out of solar PV. Right? Um, why is that? Well, actually, to a physicist, this is obvious. This is equipartition. This is telling you, actually, that the solar energy is well mixed with the wind energy. Because what goes down on the ground is actually heat. Heat gets converted very effectively to wind. Okay? Now, another point of that, that then says that, well, you know, 5% of the US land area can generate 3 terawatts. This is a, you know, uh, going to be a modest contributor uh, to, um, to, to, to renewables, and it already is, actually. It's the only significant renewable uh, in use in the U.S. However, you know, it takes a lot of space, and it doesn't work everywhere. How about hydro? Hydro, in principle, is a really nice thing because part of the problem, as you'll see with all renewables, is that they're widely dispersed, and you have to collect them at very low densities. The nice thing about hydro is that it's a point source. Valleys have collected the energy, um, and they've delivered them at a particular point. So um, here's an Ansel Adams photograph of the Hoover Dam, and you can look up how much energy you get out of it. It's 4.2 times 10 to the ninth kilowatt hours annual energy production. Um, now, but actually how much energy was available, this is a little bit more difficult to calculate, but I guess the annual rainfall in Colorado and that's the energy stored in there. Uh, um, uh, and you work out the annual average power coming down, and it's relatively small, 0.3 watts per square meter. So what we just learned here, actually, is that the energy cascade from solar into wind doesn't make it all of the way into rainfall. So, the so, 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 so we're now an order of magnitude down uh, on this. And actually, out of that, it turns out you capture uh, about 1% of even that amount. So this is actually a very poor contributor to, uh, uh, to energy resources. Um, and you know, there's issue about cost and things like that. And of course, we've run out of places to build dams. So if you run down those numbers from 300 watts full insulation to what we can currently do with a 19th century technology, by the way, concentrated solar power, is nothing more than a bunch of mirrors uh, heating up a steam engine um, to solar photovoltaic, which is running in this range, depending on whether you're dealing with conventional or leading edge technologies, biomass, tides, wind, rainwater. Um, and interestingly, all of them scale on a watts per square meter area. So, um, you know, we talk about a sustainable economy, by the way, of course, when we're talking about these mixtures of things. 
In other countries, the, uh, the energy is, is different. They're not trying to build a sustainable economy. They might be actually trying to get education and healthcare, and it gives them a different motivation. Now, last one on the numbers is, of course, if you have a grid renewable, like, uh, like solar or wind, it isn't always sunny and it isn't always windy, so you need to back it up. So if we are you know, working with, we need three terawatts, we're going to have to recycle that every 12 hours. How much energy is that? Well, actually, that is nine times the annual energy of the Hoover Dam. So if you wanted to store this energy daily, you would have to charge and discharge the Hoover Dam daily, nine times. Um, or it's actually 10 to the 8th tons of lithium-ion batteries, and that is 1,000 times the current production of lithium batteries. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, an issue is scale. Um, so I like this particular Larson cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> After a while. <laughs> this is what happens to theoretical physicists who enter this subject, right, so that you get uh, uh, driven down. Um, now, of course, the other place where energy is, is energy is in the stuff that you have made. And that, um, getting a little bit closer to what one can do in terms of technology, uh, but let's think about uh, energy. So, I mean, these days, actually, I'm working mostly on materials, and I'm going to talk a little bit towards the end of this talk about materials, but materials are actually made of energy. <laughs> and energy is made of money. And in particular, you know, one third of the cost of steel and one half of the cost of aluminum is the energy input. The fact that one is getting, by the way, to these numbers has, I think, a very interesting economics and policy balance in the end. Okay. Now, um, we have various kinds of technologies. You can have um, an iPad, so you know, it costs you $500, it weighs about 0.6 of a kilo, uh, and so you're paying for that actually a high price, it's $1,000 a kilo. Uh, so there's a lot more in from this to that. Um, or, you know, for roughly the same price per kilo, you can buy a Dreamliner. I think they're going slightly cheaper at the moment, but, but uh, um, again, that's, no, that's a 243 million list price. It's 180,000 kilos. It's about the same cost. That's batteries not included. Batteries not included. Thank you. That's right. There we go. Well put. That's right. Um, now, you can scale down to that to more familiar technologies. My favorite one is the hamburger. Um, uh, so hamburger is very nearly, uh, so you know, ground beef, $10 a kilo. This is actually mostly energy. The reason is that actually cows convert biomass to beef at an efficiency of about uh, uh, 1, 2, 3 percent. Um, and so, it, so you can actually calculate the cost of your, your beef by finding out how much you're paying for energy and multiplying by that factor. And by the way, that will also buy you a car. Um, and, you know, by the way, I learned this as, uh, from an economist who told me that there is an economics rule called the hamburger rule, which is if you're not sure how much you should be paying for something, you should weigh it and multiply by the price of hamburger. Okay. Um, where do we have to be in energy technologies? In fact, where are we? So this is an interesting one. If you buy a, um, a windmill, um, list price 10 million, weighs 6,000 tons, it's $1.50 a kilo. And you notice that it's basically been driven down to the price of the raw material. Um, and as a result of being driven down to the price of the raw material, if you then take this money and say, if I can sell that electricity at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, you get payback in three to four years. Um, so, you know, so when we're talking about materials technologies for batteries, for solar, for big things, we naturally tend to think of stuff like this. And actually, we need to be not even doing stuff like this, but we need to be down at this price point. And if we don't get to that price point, we're not going to get anywhere. So another way of looking at those numbers, I mean, I put down, you know, price, energy consumed. And if you like, you can say that, no, this gives you an implied cost of energy based on the price. So, you know, steel, um, you know, if it was all energy, the implied cost is 13 cents. Aluminum is a little bit higher, hamburger is 11 cents, diesel is 8 cents, uh, wheat flour become vegetarian, it's 23 cents, pretty darn efficient. Um, looking at the other way, if you take a wind turbine, you get payoff costing $1.50 a kilo, 
This is about three and a half years. And interesting, solar panels, if you add a dollar per watt, the payoff is around four years. So notice that these are numbers where you hit price points where you might expect people to pay attention. Um, and uh, so, you know, so, so what is happening? Well, I mean, I think you know, this is my attempt at economics, which isn't very good. What you're looking at here is, sorry, if, if you're, if you're a, uh, um, a government agency like me, um, you say, here is US government R&D in solar. Look at what it did. It produced venture capital, that's the green bar, which is growing. People even being prepared to borrow money to do this. Public equity. So that this is a huge triumph for a small investment on here. But of course, what really happened was that the oil price did this. Uh, the technology stayed essentially constant. And the oil price produced a, uh, a, a temporary spike. Um, where has that spike gone? Well, if you look at you know, uh, non-hydro renewable sources in the US from 1998 to 2012, uh, solar is indistinguishable from the axis. And by the way, the top of this scale is 5%. So solar makes no dent whatsoever. This is geo, this is bio, bio, bioenergy. The only thing which is growing on this curve is wind. Because wind can be uh, digested in chunks. Um, it gives you a reliable payback at a price point that people can understand. Um, and you don't have to pay an electrician to install it on your roof. You can do it in a different way. The only problem is that this is, this is going to plateau because we run out of wind. But it'll go some way. So a recap. Um, the physics bit here is you know, equipartition of energy, and it really matters. You know, we come in with one form of energy. It gets mixed up in a few places. Okay. One of the things which I think is actually positive here is that you can now see that energy is actually money. Um, the Industrial Revolution began because of many things, but one of the things that clearly helped was the access to energy that was really free. Um, and in fact, the first use of uh, major industrial technologies, of course, was to get water out of mines. Um, and so there was a virtuous circle for all of the technologies and all of the way we live that depend on the fact that energy is free. I think we're getting close to the point where energy is actually money. Now, others may comment on this about how close we are to the point. But once you get to that point where energy is no longer cheap, it changes everything about the way you think about it. And I don't know where we end up. Okay. So I'm very optimistic. And I think we're actually close to that point where we can get some kind of transition. Um, just because you know, at the point where you're, you can get reasonable paybacks, then, uh, then the economics begin to change. But it's not quite there yet. Another point, actually, I ask people is, interestingly, you know, we're all trying to have money. You know, I'm trying to wonder what I'd like to have in my pension plan. And I think I'd like to, somebody to launch a pension plan which guaranteed me so many kilowatt hours. <laughs> right? If we actually had a tradable energy economy, that would, in fact, be possible. And that would be much better than my trying to guess how many, you know, how many dollars I actually needed at some indefinable time in the future. Because I think we can be fairly confident that the, that the one thing which is going to retain value is actually energy. And we should, you know, we, we, we should you know, instead of minting trillion dollar coins, we should monetize it, go back on the gold standard, but make it kilowatt hours. Um, a bit about technology. Um, uh, how am I doing? Oh, plenty, because I'd like to give some time for discussion, because I've got you all annoyed, I think, by now. Um, so now I want to go, d go down to um, uh, technology. And I particularly want to talk about materials. And, and of course, there are many aspects of this, and I'm going to pick on it just a few things. Um, if you look at the four things that we have in the use of energy in the economy, the things that you need to care about are generation, and then storage, and then transmission, and then use. And as you go down from here, you go from things which are basically large area and require large scale pervasive technologies, because you have to collect the energy from large areas, whereas use is easier. And the reason that use is easier is that use is typically a point source. It's people, it's factories, it's computers, it's light bulbs. 
So, as somebody, I think, pointed out over lunch, that the best low-hanging fruit is to deal with the use issues because that's by far the simplest because they occur at a point, at least in the global scale, and that's where we ought to be spending a lot of our time, and we don't. But I, in common with everybody else, spend my time up here. Uh, um, but but uh, you know, maybe I'm mistaken. So, but if you look through these, you know, what are the sets of technologies we're talking about? Solar PV or solar to fuel? Storage in terms of uh, batteries, uh, capacitors. Transmission. Um, uh, refrigeration, which is an important technology which involves thermoelectrics. Lighting, which is more or less now should pass over almost entirely to very highly efficient LEDs. And you, know, you could add in here rather important materials technologies which need to get in there for things like water. Well, I said I wouldn't talk about water, and I won't talk any more about that. And one can add things to this list, um, but in fact there aren't very many. The main problem I have with all of this is that we have never done any of this before. Um, when you think about materials, you think about things that stand up, hold things up, fly, they're structural, they're not what I, as a condensed matter physicist, would call a functional material. I'd always seemed a bit unfair, actually, on, 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 on structural engineering. You know, but a functional material is something through which electrons pass, or ions pass, or some stuff happens. And the only wide-scale electrical materials technology that we have implemented by the ton is actually a wire, a simple metal. You know, we don't know how to do all of these things on the right scale. And we haven't learned to do that. And that's partly because for the last 50 years of materials technology, we've been focusing on the $1,000 per kilo market, which is, you know, which is IT. Um, so if we're going to make any dent here, we need to go back and understand how to do very basic things in this way. So how much headroom is that? Oops, sorry, I'm going back. Now, um, there's an enabling technology which, get, which you, you kind of need to get uh, a long way away, which is to do with energy storage, and I'll talk a little bit about energy storage and what's the motivation for that. I already gave you one motivation. Um, there's no point, actually, in having solar and wind if you don't have uh, grid storage to back it up. Um, also there's a piece of low-hanging fruit, namely that 70% or so of our oil use is for transportation. Um, it's about 14% of total energy consumption. It generates 1.7 gigatons of CO2 per year, which is 30% of the total US emission. There's already a well-developed market for uh, lithium batteries and consumer electronics. And in some sense, there's a weakly disruptive path to implementation where you can gradually introduce one technology on another via hybrid vehicles. And so that motivates this as a kind of weak point of entry. Um, sorry, this is already old. I mean, notice that the you know, battery technologies are already big business. In 2008, we start chargeable technologies, batteries with three, three and a half billion, and this is really out of date. This has now uh, uh, outstripped this. There are now more rechargeable batteries than primary batteries. This is growing at 30 35%, 40% a year. But I already pointed out that despite the fact that we are making 3 billion or so, well, in fact, now around 10 billion cells or so per year of world production, if you wanted to back up the grid with lithium-ion batteries, that is a factor of 1,000 too small. Um, uh, so, you know, a little dense. Well, no, made down the road from here. You can uh, buy one of these things. And let's see where battery technology has got and where it might go. So this is the Chevy Volt. If you own a Chevy Volt, and you should, they're great vehicles. However, the battery in it weighs 200 kilos. This is the battery. It's about six feet tall. It actually costs about 8,000 bucks, which is around $500 per kilowatt hour. Um, and it will get you around 40 miles on the battery, and it, uh, so uh, alone. Um, uh, so uh, <coughs> um, you know, th this is a pretty clunky technology. If you look at battery technologies and where they've gone over the last few years, lead acid is, so what I'm looking at here is actually power per unit volume, power per unit mass, along these, going from standard technologies like, like lead acid 
nickel cadmium to advanced lithium ion batteries which are up here, um, we're at numbers which are around 300-350 uh, watt hours per liter, 250 per kilo. What is that in comparison to gasoline? Well, gasoline is 12,000 watt hours per liter. It's, you know, it's far the other side of this wall. Okay. And it's about a factor of 60 by weight. Is it plausible uh, that you can get close to this number? Well, let's look inside a battery and see what's there. If you open up a battery uh, and look, so here's a cathode, here's an anode, so it, no, batteries consist of cathodes and anodes and something in between. Um, and this is what you've made if you look inside. This is on a scale of one micron and this is a scale of two microns. Okay. The first thing is I look at this and I say, my goodness, that's a mess. I don't know why this is called a technology. Okay. Right? Um, uh, it, it's... Um, uh, it's then no, it's actually two orders of magnitude be below optimal performance. Why do I know that? Well, I know that because actually I'm a theoretical physicist, and I can envisage devices like this one, which happens to be a, a, a mixture of two common compounds, strontium titanate and lanthanum aluminate, which, if you grow them in precisely the same way, grow charges at these layers and can be charged up in the sun. And I know that the theoretical capacity of devices like this, um, in fact, approaches gasoline. And this happens to be, by the way, both a solar cell um, and a battery at the same point. Okay. Now, this is a, th well, it's not exactly a theoretical device. It's a, uh, uh, you know, when one is fairly close to being able to make things like this. Okay. But you know, part of the point here is just looking at this is that the, this is not the problem. Um, uh, the problem in some sense is how to get from something like that to something like that because they don't look at all similar. Okay. <coughs> um, and it's also clear that if you start with this and try and iterate you won't evolve your way to something like that either. <coughs> so the, um, uh, and, you know, and, you know, and batteries you know, are a perfect example of something where one should do an end run around this. Because, in fact, you don't even know how batteries work. They're very difficult to manufacture. They use materials which are rather expensive and you don't want to use. And you don't actually have a predictable path forward. And what I would compare that to is, uh, is this. Um, this is Moore's Law. Which you will know, this is a silicon performance on a log scale. Here it's transistors on a chip. And here is the year, and we're up to about 2010. And it's been going up on a pretty steep curve like this. But in some sense, it isn't so much the fact that it's going up on a log scale. It's the fact that it's going up predictably, and it's been going up predictably for a very long time. The reason it's going up predictably is that back in the 50s, we understood the technology of silicon, so that by the time we were trying to make silicon devices, we knew how this material behaved. We knew how to dope it. We knew how to fabricate it. We knew how to grow single crystals. We knew how to do all of the things associated with the core technology so that we could keep moving through here in a predictable fashion. And by the way, these are expensive technologies. If you want to build a, a, a fad for the latest uh, um, uh, generation of transistors, you have to get somebody to lend you two or three billion dollars. Right. The only reason you can borrow two or three billion dollars is by convincing somebody you really know what you're doing. So here's our battery technology. Um, and so this is a progression of battery technology from what we have now, which is this is cathode and anode, this is lithium metal oxide and graphite. Um, this is a technology which is just about being introduced, and we're moving up. We get to 2017, and there's, an, there's a, the alloy is, the, ah, we believe that the cathode is going to be made of something called lithium 2 MXO4. You don't know any elements called M or X, and that's because we haven't decided what goes in here yet. And by 2019, we we're pre predicting we're making something out of something called UNC. UNC, UNC stands for unknown, high voltage, high capacity cathode. You know, I don't think I can take this to a bank and borrow money. Right? So, so, the, so the real problem actually is developing platforms that will develop the technologies that we need in the future. So going back, we have roadmaps. And we don't actually have roadmaps for any of the technologies that we're, that we're dealing with. 
And trying to get things down from top-down engineering is already a problem. So you know, that, that, that 800 kilogram battery that you actually have in your Chevy Volt, two-thirds of the weight of it is quaintly called packaging by the industry. Ah, uh, thank you. Right, that's right. So, the, so right, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, and this is control electronics, safety engineering, casing, so that if it blows up, nobody dies. And indeed, most of the cost of a solar panel installation is not the module. I mean, uh, Steve Forrest was remarking at lunch is that if you made modules for free, it's still not possible to install them because you have to do power electronics, packaging, installation costs, permit fees. Um, you know, every, every village in every state has you know, separate rules for all of these things. So, um, so, so my view about the technology is that we actually have to learn to construct completely different classes of technologies which are designed on the nanoscale and have to be manufactured uh, at low cost and enormous volume. And this isn't a surprise, I think, to anybody who's doing this, but it has to be a complete end run around what we're doing now. Um, so you know, we're going to have to develop <coughs> um, methodologies that involve theory and modeling, new synthetic frameworks, manufacturing strategies and in situ tools, but we're driven by a very different way of making things. Again, not a surprise to anybody who's involved in material science these days. Where we actually uh, do things by knowing where the atoms are, but we enable technologies that can be manufactured at, at uh, very cheaply. Now, by the way, I don't think I know how to do that. I'm fairly certain it won't be done this way. I don't know whether it will be done that way or that way or some kind of hybrid in between. But our fixation with this stuff, actually, at the moment, is a bit of a problem, I would say. So, you know, final remarks, because I'm at the end. You know, uh, you know in, the, in the end, actually, uh, I, I think, you know, I'm actually pretty optimistic that, um, you know, with a bit of time, actually quite a lot of time, but not necessarily very much money, the problems are actually containable at the level of science and we need to be working on this, because I don't want to say that we know how to do this, but in principle there are paths and there are routes and there are ways of doing this. It involves different ways of thinking. Um, I, you know, I shouldn't pronounce on this because I don't really understand it, but the big challenge here is that you know, we are going to have to spend very large amounts of money. and We have very uncertain technology paths and, it's going to, and a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money on the way. But I also like the idea that we're getting to the point where energy itself has become expensive enough that the cost of many things is just the energy that goes into them. And once you get there, I think you can get into a different kind of uh, feedback loop. Right? And then, now the last one, by the way, is the issue of geopolitics, which I think is kind of questionable. What I will point out is that most countries in the world have much more incentive to innovate than we do. Everywhere else needs this more than we do, and the real challenge is that we not be the slow coach in this, that we actually manage to find a way of leading. Because unfortunately, we have a grid, we have natural gas, we have roads, and we have oil. And so you, know, so you can take the, uh, you know, a policy that for a few years we can kind of get by and wait for 20 or 30 years where things will get really bad. And then we will be importing the next generation of technologies from somewhere else. So, End of my comments, so thanks for your time. Yeah.